Welcome to my scientifically informed insider look at mental health topics. If you find this video to be interesting or helpful, please like it and subscribe to my channel. Hello, this is Dr. Grande. Today's question asks if I can look at the mental health and personality aspects in the Harold Fish murder case. And another question related to this is what role did the dark triad play in this case? So this is an interesting case. It's not a particularly popular case. But I think it's interesting because it contains a few lessons for individuals who are in relationships with people who are narcissistic, psychopathic, or Machiavellianistic. These three traits together are called the dark triad, and specifically for those who might be in some danger because of this. Also, it really emphasizes the need to be on the lookout for dark triad traits in unexpected places. So at first glance, the Harold Fish murder case seems fairly straightforward particularly when compared to a lot of the crimes that I've covered in different videos. So again, at first it seems kind of simple, but then as you look at it a little more, it gets quite a bit more complex. So first I'll start with the timeline, and then look at how the dark triad could have played a role in this case, and then kind of look at what we can learn from a case like this. So the timeline we have here, this starts and really ends in one day. This whole incident occurred in one day, and then of course there's a trial afterward. But the important day was May 11, 2004, on Pine Canyon Trail. This is in Arizona. And the people involved in this case, there were a number of people, but I'm just going to focus really on three. The first is Harold Fish, a 57-year-old retired Spanish teacher, hereafter just referred to as Harold. Then we have Grant Cusley, who is 43 years old. He lived in the forest. At one time, he was a fire inspector. Hereafter, I'll just refer to him as Grant. So we have Harold and Grant. And then the prosecutor was named Michael Lessler. But of course he comes in later. He wasn't assigned on May 11, 2004. That's the date of the killing. So these individuals I'm talking about, of course, are real people. So I'm not diagnosing anybody, only speculating about what could be happening in a situation like this. So Harold was just finishing a walk on this trail. And this was an all-day walk. And he came across Grant, who was camped by his car, by Grant's car, with three dogs. Two of those dogs were unleashed right after Harold waved to Grant just to say hi and let him know he was there on the trail. So we see again three dogs, two of them are coming at Harold. Harold yells out to Grant to control the dogs. Grant makes no effort to stop the dogs. Harold draws his 10 millimeter semi-automatic pistol from his backpack and fires one round into the ground in an effort to get the dogs to disengage. One of the dogs runs off the trail, another one stops. So he was successful in stopping the attack by the dogs. Now we see at this point that Grant, again allegedly, starts charging towards Harold. Harold yells out something like, I didn't hurt your dogs, thinking of course that's why Grant was charging at him. Like he heard the firearm go off and he was then closing the distance between himself and Harold. So Harold claims that Grant was saying something like, I'm going to hurt you, and swinging his arms in a sort of random way, like swinging and punching in the air. This becomes kind of important later on. Harold says again that he didn't hurt the dogs, tells him to stop, to leave him alone, and he yells no. But Grant keeps on coming. At this point, Harold shoots Grant three times in the chest. Grant drops to the ground without saying anything else. When asked if Harold said something, Later on in the interview, he responded by saying that for the first five seconds after he shot Grant, he was so angry that he really couldn't do anything. He lost his cool, and the anger got him, and he had to calm down. But after that, he did try to help Grant. He put a backpack under his head, and he covered him up with a tarp, I guess in an effort to keep him warm. Now, because they were in a remote area, Harold's phone didn't work, so he had to go a distance from where the shooting happened, to find a motorist and flag him down and ask him to call for help, which he did. And then he returned to the scene of the shooting to stay with Grant until the paramedics and the police arrived. Harold talked to the police as soon as they arrived, which of course many people would consider a huge mistake. I'll talk about that later. But he talked to the police. He didn't appear to be hiding anything. Now, at first, many thought this was clearly self-defense. Harold was a family man with seven children, no criminal history, a good work history, he had a permit for the firearm that he was carrying. He had never used his firearm in a self-defensive episode before. He had never met Grant before. 
Nothing was stolen from Grant's car or from Grant's person, and there was no obvious motive for any type of murder. Grant also had a history of terrorizing and harassing people, which we find out about a little later. So we see here that even though this looked like self-defense, the prosecutor decided to charge Harold with second-degree murder, right? Not even something like manslaughter. He jumps right to second-degree murder. And the trial starts in 2006. And the prosecutor said that it's about behavior, not about somebody's character. But then, in the prosecutor's theory of the crime, again, the prosecutor was Michael Lessler, in this theory of the crime, Harold was self-righteous, strict, had a strong sense of morality, was vindictive. If people didn't do what Harold wanted, they had to be punished. So even though the prosecutor said it was about behavior, it sounds a lot like character was really the issue. Essentially calling Harold narcissistic and maybe a little bit of obsessive compulsive personality traits mixed in there. Now he didn't use the words narcissism or OCPD, but it just sounds like that. Usually prosecutors look at a defendant and call them something like psychopathic, like cold and callous and engaging in a lot of criminal acts. So this prosecutor kind of went a different route in terms of the mental health or personality aspects he tried to assign to Harold. Now there really didn't seem to be much justification to file these charges. There were a few inconsistencies in the timeline. For example, there was a woman a half mile away who said she heard the shooting take place at 5.30, but the guy that Harold flagged down said 6.40. But interestingly, that witness who said it happened at 5.30 admitted eventually that she calculated the time based on the position of the sun, not by looking at her watch or her cell phone. Also, Harold told the police initially that Grant said he was going to kill him when Grant was charging toward him, but he told the grand jury that Grant might have said he was going to kill him, hurt him, or shoot him. So he changed his story a little bit. It was really a minor inconsistency, but the prosecutor really grabbed hold of this. So essentially, the prosecution said that Harold shot Grant in a rage and really had two choices at that point. Run away and probably not get caught, but if he were to be caught, it would be hard to claim self-defense, or take some time and arrange the crime scene and make up a story consistent with self-defense, which of course is the prosecutor's theory of the crime here. Now when we get to the trial, we see that there was some really key testimony here that led eventually to Harold's conviction. We see one bullet went through Grant's hand before striking his chest. The prosecution made this claim that his hands must have been in front of him, and that meant his hands were up in the air. And there was also this claim that Harold's gun was overpowered, meaning a 10 millimeter was more powerful than what police commonly carried, and that it was loaded with hollow points, which were designed to kill people. It seems kind of obvious that guns and cartridges are designed to kill people, but this was what the prosecutor said and he thought this was a good point. He also said that when Harold pulled the trigger, he knew that the bullets would kill Grant. Again, I think this is fairly consistent with self-defense or murder. I'm not sure how there would be any lack of knowledge here between Harold and how a firearm functioned. I don't know how that really helps the prosecution's case. When somebody points a weapon at somebody and pulls the trigger, I think it makes sense that they would believe that's going to kill the person, or at least stop them. But Either way, this was the argument of the prosecution. And we also see that Grant's dogs were on loan from the Humane Society, and they said the dogs were not aggressive. Now, the defense theory of the crime was fairly straightforward. They went with what Harold said, self-defense. On their side, they had Harold's character, lack of criminal record. Witnesses said that one of the dogs was aggressive. Harold did attempt to render aid. They labeled those inconsistencies in the time as just nitpicking. And on cross-examination, one of the prosecution witnesses admitted that Grant could have been charging toward Harold. So this kind of undoes the whole argument that Grant's hands were up and he was standing still. What I found interesting here is that Harold did not testify. Now, I'm not an attorney, but this just seems a little bit unusual in a case like this. You would think the jury would want to hear from Harold that he didn't do it, that it was self-defense. So... Now, of course, Harold had the right not to testify, and what the jury wants to hear is not something they can always get to hear. If Harold had testified, that may have satisfied the concerns they had in the case. Some other key points for the defense, 10 separate people testified that Grant had an explosive temper and was violent. He would get agitated quickly, clench his fists, wave them around, and become threatening. Right? So completely consistent with what Harold said, 
even though Harold had never met Grant, and that had been established. That was something that the prosecution conceded. They didn't know each other. But the jury really didn't get the full story. The defense was limited quite a bit by the court and how much that information really got to the jury about the witnesses saying that Grant was violent and his different motions. They got some of it, but not all of it. They didn't really get a full picture. Now, the jury didn't hear at all about a few other things. They didn't hear about specific stories with Grant and how he'd become angry when somebody would say something about his dogs or limit his dogs from coming in a building, how one of the dogs was almost shot by the police when the dog was in the custody of somebody else, the mental health history of Grant, including post-traumatic stress disorder, and the fact that he attempted to commit suicide twice in the preceding two years, and the fact that he was in possession of a seven-inch screwdriver. It was in his back pocket. The jury was led to believe that Grant was unarmed. Now, interestingly, we see in interviews that the jury did believe Harold's character was good, and they did believe that Grant was aggressive. They were mixed on whether Harold was lying in terms of those inconsistent statements, and some were upset that he didn't render more aid. They thought because he had experience with scouting that he should have been able to stop the bleeding from three 10 millimeter bullet wounds to the chest. I mean, I'm not a physician, but that seems like an extraordinary thing to ask somebody to do in a self-defensive situation, but it was what they were concerned about. One didn't like the choice of cartridges, specifically, again, that they were 10 millimeter cartridges and that they were hollow points. And a few did believe the medical examiner's testimony that Grant was stopped before the shots were fired. The jury returned a verdict of guilty, saying that it was a tragic mistake because Harold had another option other than self-defense. They think he should have waited five or ten seconds before the shooting. Keep in mind, the whole incident took place within ten seconds, and they believe he should have waited five to ten more seconds. It's interesting to note here that the distance between Grant and Harold when the shots were fired, it was around five to eight feet. So in five to ten more seconds, Grant would have been right there. He would have been on top of Harold. But either way, this is what the jury thought. Now, later the same year when this conviction took place, we see that the law was changed so that the prosecution would have had to prove that the defendant was not acting in self-defense. This wasn't the case in the trial of Harold. And with this law change, this could have been used in a retrial of Harold, right? So this was good news for him. But there never was a second trial. The Arizona Court of Appeals reversed the conviction, and Harold was exonerated and released from prison in 2009. And in 2012, he died from cancer. Now, during the course of the trial, the defense alleged that Michael Lessler, the prosecutor, engaged in prosecutorial misconduct. So it appears that he tried to prevent law enforcement from collecting evidence that would have been exculpatory. He apparently gave them explicit instructions to avoid gathering information when he knew that information would be helpful for the defense. Of course, this was illegal if he had actually done it, and we don't know if he did it or not. But some witnesses testified that he did, apparently. So what we see here is that some people would believe that the prosecutor was behaving in a narcissistic way, putting his career ambitions ahead of the truth. So with all this in mind with this case, what do I think happened here and what can we learn from this case? Well, many people think this is a clear case of self-defense, and I tend to agree. The best evidence supports that Harold was telling the truth. His statements about being angry, about having to cool down before he could render aid, have upset some people. And I think this is understandable, but some people react to danger with anger and not fear, or the anger is there along with the fear, but they might notice the anger more. Many people believe in this case the prosecutor was way out of line and his traits were consistent with narcissism and Machiavellianism, two of the three dark triad traits. Now, the out of line part seems reasonable. In terms of whether he was narcissistic or Machiavellianistic, I don't know. Again, I can't diagnose anybody. I can only speculate about what could be happening in a case like this. But some prosecutors certainly are. They do have dark triad traits perhaps driven by a need for admiration, a sense of entitlement, fantasies of success and power, a lack of empathy, and a willingness to manipulate. Now, on the Machiavellianistic side, some prosecutors are opportunistic, cynical, they're good at long-term strategy, and they kind of look out only for themselves. 
Many prosecutors link the outcome of the case to their identity, so not getting the conviction means somehow that they failed, not that justice was done. Now, that may make sense in this situation, right, with what we see in terms of the behaviors being manifested. Again, it's impossible to speak to somebody's mental health or personality directly. We can only look at behaviors and see certain alignments and speculate. We see in the same case that Harold was accused of essentially being narcissistic, that vindictive component I talked about before, and Grant was essentially accused of being narcissistic. Vindictive, just like Harold in a way, and perhaps having a sense of entitlement. So with all three of these people, we see these kind of ideas that the dark triad traits were involved somehow. Like it was a confluence of three people with traits that don't necessarily work well in our society. So those are my thoughts on the case. What can we learn from the case? Well, I think one lesson here is don't ever let a situation escalate to where a self-defense scenario is likely, right? Because no one wins in those situations. It doesn't look like Harold may have had much of a choice, although I would wonder if he could have retreated a bit more before firing. But Grant certainly did have a choice. No one disputes that after the gun was fired, after Harold fired that warning shot to the dogs, that it's Grant that closed the distance between the two of them. Now, he may have stopped, or he may not have, but again, he's the one that approached Harold. Both sides, the prosecution and the defense, agree on this point. Now, we see that Harold did not know the nature of Grant before he encountered him, or really even after he encountered him, he learned much later. He didn't have the advantage of knowing that Grant may have been violent, aggressive, psychopathic, or sociopathic, whatever the case was, I don't know, but again, these are things that were said. But many people are able to identify these traits in others. If someone's dangerous and you know it, you have to do your best to avoid a confrontation with them. As we see in the testimony, many people did try to avoid Grant. Another learning point from this case is don't assume that the so-called bad character of somebody will be used against them, and so-called good character would be used for somebody. Some people who are in relationships with people who have dark triad traits assume that if something happens, like an argument or violence or an outburst, that people will take those dark triad traits into consideration, right? That they'll side with the person who's the victim because the other person has dark triad traits. But we see this is not necessarily the case. The next lesson is always have an attorney present before talking to the police, because even if the police are on your side, which is not by any means a guarantee, the prosecutor may not be on your side. It's their job to get convictions. Another point here is that having some sort of evidence like a video or audio would have been really helpful in a case like this. Now, this can only be obtained, of course, in areas where it would be legal. But I think in a park in Arizona, certainly it would have been legal for Harold to have some type of recording device. This wouldn't have been something he would have thought of necessarily in that short time frame. But again, it just speaks to the importance of this type of evidence. This could have all been avoided if he had something like that. So again, where legal, if something can be put into a video recording or audio recording, that kind of removes all doubt about what actually happened especially when it's just two people and they have different stories. Although, of course, in this case, Grant never got to tell his story because he was killed by Harold, but I think the point still remains valid that concrete evidence is a lot easier to evaluate than someone's testimony. And the last lesson here is that narcissists can be in unexpected places, positions of power and authority, and they often are. People also may believe them. Like we see in this case, the jury believed a lot of things that just made no sense. Right? They, they believe things that I don't understand how anyone could have believed in those circumstances. But they were led to believe these things by the prosecution. So we really have to be careful. There's no reason to believe that individuals with dark triad traits are limited in terms of their career opportunities. So awareness and caution is warranted. Another thing here would be that trust has to be earned. A lot of times we think of distrust as bad. Right? It's related to vulnerable narcissism. It's related to being disagreeable. But trust has to be earned. Having a healthy distrust of people is not a bad thing. When Harold was in this confrontation with Grant, he probably believed the worst of this was over. It was unfortunate that he killed him, of course, and Harold thought the same thing. He didn't want to be in the situation he was in. But he probably thought that everybody he'd be dealing with at that point would be interested in hearing his story and would believe him and not be calling him, essentially, a narcissist. But, of course, 
we know that's not what happened to Harold. So this is an interesting case. Again, not a very popular case, but there's a lot of different lessons that can be learned from it. So I think it's kind of a shame it gets overlooked so much. This only involved the death of one person, right? And a lot of times the cases that draw attention are the cases that involve the deaths of many. But again, the lessons are still very important. And the tragedy is still there. The individual here, Grant, lost his life, and that was tragic. And now whenever I talk about cases like this that could involve dark triad traits or other mental health or personality characteristics, there will be a variety of opinions. People who agree or disagree with me or have other thoughts or opinions, please put those opinions and thoughts in the comments section. They always generate a really interesting dialogue. As always, I hope you found this description of the Harold Fish case to be interesting. Thanks for watching.